Hi, my name is Brooke, and I am a writer at Pine Reads Review. I'm also on the social media team. And today I'm here with Paul Castle, who is the author and illustrator of The Pengrooms. Hi, Brooke. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Of course, of course. I'm so excited to talk to you. Um, I love the book. I think it's the most adorable thing I've ever seen. I'm obsessed. Can you tell me the origin story of how you came up with the Pangrooms and, and just how that idea formed? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. It kind of has a, a fun origin story because it all began with my own marriage to my husband, Matthew, who uh, proposed to me, actually, what was that? It was exactly four years ago. We just celebrated our, what I like to call our proposal anniversary, <laughs> And this was the day it all began because after he, he proposed, uh, we had to start planning our wedding. Cause you know, after the, you know, once mm -hmm. that happens, that's all anybody wants to know. Well, when's it going to be? Have you picked a date? Have you picked a date? So we, we picked a date and I said, well, we got to send out these invitations and I said to my husband, well, we need to take like a special photo or pick a picture to put on the invitations. And my husband rolled his eyes. I mean, like we do a lot of social media. He's like, do we have to take another photo? Can't you just draw us instead? He's like, you're an artist. Why don't you just draw a picture? And so I was inspired and I said, okay, fine, we can do that. But I'm not going to draw us as human beings. I'm going to actually make us into these adorable little penguins. I picked penguins because they were the only animal I could think of that were sort of already in formal wear and formal attire, like these little tuxedos. So I was like, okay, that's perfect. They're kind of the perfect little wedding motif. And I slapped on some rainbow colored bow ties and I kind of, I showed it to Matthew and he loved it. And I said, I jokingly called them the Pengrooms because I, I just, I love, I love a good pun. I'm Me kind too. of a sucker. Love <laughs> a sucker. <laughs> exactly. Who can resist? That's a beautiful <laughs> origin story. That's so cute. Um, well, that, yeah, that's how the idea began. And it was actually just a little bit later um, when the pandemic hit and we were in mm -hmm. lockdown that my husband, my dad, my, we were now married. He said, Paul, you know, this is such a fun idea. This is such a fun concept. And it's been your dream, you know, to make your first children's book. And actually, I was kind of, kind of working on another children's book project at the time that was going oh. to be my debut that I, I, he said, put that one aside. Cause it was giving me a lot of creative trouble. It was like, uh -huh. I was kind of hitting a wall with it. And I was like, I don't know where this is going. If this is the uh -huh. right idea. And he said, Paul, the right idea is staring you in the face and everybody <laughs> loves these pengrooms. It, it's gotta be the pengrooms. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when I started writing that very day, uh, I, I got to work on it. And so that's how it came out. Wow. That previous idea that, that you were kind of working on, did you ever like revisit that or? It is still sitting on a shelf, like in my imagination, mostly with a lot of like um, primitive sketches and things done in a few drafts. And mm -hmm. it is something I have actually quite a few ideas like that sort of in my my ever growing compendium of of unrealized concepts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that most creatives have that. And if ever the day comes that like I desperately need an idea and I need you know, to start on a new project, well, I, I kind of have a bin filled with them and that that still exists. It could come to be. It was about a little character named Figaro Puddlefern. And he's, of course, oh. you know, <laughs> he's so like, cute. yeah, and he was a little, he was a, a little artist creature, a woodland creature. But the, the story also, of course, touched on LGBTQ themes, which, mm -hmm. which as is evident with the Pengrooms is an important theme for me. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's wonderful. Well, I hope the world gets to see it one day. That sounds awesome. <laughs> um, those who have read The Pengrooms know that you dedicate the book to your husband, Matthew, and so much of the origin story has to do with your wedding. And and so I'm wondering if in the book, do Pringle and Finn have like parallels in their dynamic to um, you and your husband's dynamic? Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah. It was really important that for me that I, I get in as metal, many little references um, about the two of us as I could, because, you know, the core of the story, the theme of the story, it's about, I mean, ostensibly it is a, um, a children's book that is meant to sort of normalize and, and same-sex weddings for, for kids. Um, but 
you know, it's really about relationships. It's about all types of relationships. And when you find somebody to be with, whether they're the, of the same sex or the opposite sex or, or, or don't identify any gender, you're going to be in a relationship in which you will have strengths and weaknesses and you have to ultimately learn to work as a team. And so that is what the story and the theme of the story is really truly about. So yes, Pringle is more of the artistic um, one and he's perhaps a little, you know, messier and <laughs> less uh uh, organized in his approach to life and I think mm -hmm. Finn is really he is the baker so he is sort of like the scientific approach and and it has like a plan and that's how I think of Matthew and I a lot of the time I have like all of these great big ideas but I don't really know necessarily what to do with them and Matthew's the man with the plan and so like when we come together we find a way to like execute these things as a team and so mm -hmm. like we are professionals like we work together we have our own business and we run our social media accounts and we don't make cakes <laughs> like the penguins <laughs> do, but we make other kinds of things. And uh -huh. I really couldn't have done the book without him because I am legally blind. Oh. I've lost, mm -hmm. I've lost 90% of my vision. And Matthew was my art director. He art directed the whole thing. So mm -hmm. I would come to him at the end of every week with all the new sketches and he would have his big red pen out and he'd be like, this, you know, we need to change this, this, and this, and this doesn't make sense. And, oh, you have like a... <laughs> huge mark here you probably didn't even see and he of course he was always right so <laughs> <laughs> much like the penguins you know we came to uh we kind of create these things together using our strengths and also my husband is a concert violinist he's an incredibly talented musician so i had to That's squeeze that crazy. in there too That's so awesome. you'll notice that the character of finn does play the violin and the wow. child <laughs> in the story <laughs> yeah. wow that's so sweet as well that really moves makes me believe in love um that's yeah. wonderful um were there any picture books you really loved as a kid and did you draw any inspiration from those in creating the penguins so many I mean I I was always a huge huge lover of uh, Dr. Seuss and a big big fan of Richard Scarry who did all these like um uh, so anthropomorphized animal characters mm -hmm. that I just like poured over his illustrations as a child. Uh, the Giving Tree uh, is love one of the my favorites. Tree. Yeah, it's just like I love it because it's it's for kids, but it also has so many it's deeper messages that resonate yeah. with adults. And it was always like I admire it so much when a story can transcend what we expect from a children's um, mm -hmm. book or movie or whatever it may be. When it when it goes a little further and deeper and has these like deeper path pathos and, and meanings that are sort of hidden in there and that you can grow That's up with those and eventually yeah I mean there's something really special about that and really mm -hmm. um the so the giving tree is a great example of that and there's this um old um very old a hundred year old book called the adventures of snuggle pot and cuddle pie by may gibb and she was a writer and illustrator from australia that I was acquainted I was acquainted with a collection of her books they were gifted to me by um, some extended family that lived in Australia when I was just a little boy. And her stories and illustrations just sort of captured my imagination as well as a kid. So I, yeah, I mean, it's been with me since childhood. I wrote my first children's book, I guess, on my own time when I was six years old. And I, I stole a copy of um, a book from my brother's shelf, um, a hardback book. It was called G.I. Joe's in Outer Space. And I, I, I ripped out all the pages, but I salvaged oh the God. hard, I salvaged <laughs> the hard cover because I just needed to put my story in between two hard covers because that was for me at the age of six would make my book real. And so I, <laughs> I, I taped in, <laughs> I, I took these sheets of paper and I taped in my own story about a turtle and I called it the sad turtle. And it's about a sad turtle. And I think that that sad turtle might have represented me as a child without friends <laughs> who spent his weekends at home writing children's books. Aww. But he does find a group of friends in the end, and it's a very happy ending. So spoiler alert. Oh, cute. <laughs> um, you touched on a little bit the struggles of illustrating with your eye condition, retinitis pigmentosa. Could you talk a little bit more about like what the various challenges have been with that and the various triumphs and just what that journey has been like? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a big one because I've been a passionate visual storyteller, you know, since at least the age of six, sort of like I just explained. 
knowing that I didn't just love to consume art and but that I wanted to create it. Like I knew it from that age at the age of six, I wanted to to write and illustrate and eventually wanted to be a Disney animator and work in film and create all these things. And then I, I was moving along this trajectory, believing I was going to work in this visual field. And then at the age of 16, I was actually diagnosed with the eye disease of retinitis pigmentosa. It's a genetic disease, but nobody in my family had experienced the symptoms before. So we were totally, uh, to, for lack of a better term, we were blindsided by it because we had um, had no awareness of, of it and had never had never even heard the words. And so we immediately looked into this. Um, I was diagnosed at 16 because I was learning to drive a car and I nearly got into this like crazy car accident. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, everybody was fine. But it was because I had these blind spots forming in my central, in my, my visual field that I thought was perfectly normal how everybody else saw the world. And then it was uh, apparent that I saw things very differently. So at the age of 16, learning that, well, I have an untreatable eye disease that is progressive, that leads to total blindness. And I, here I am a visual storyteller, an artist, and a creative who just saw my future being in the visual, uh, you know, art world, was like crazy. Like, I don't even know how to wrap my head around it. At the time, I was like, well, this is wild. This is really unexpected. Not what I was planning for. But at the same time, I'm so passionate about these things in my life. I'm not going to suddenly not pursue them. So despite that, I, I mean, the challenges being that my, my visual field continued to get narrower and narrower and my acuity got a little worse and my low light detecting cells were dying. But I just, despite that, was like, well, this is what I got to do. I'm going to do it until I can't do it anymore, until I absolutely have to pivot. And so um, here, you know, 16 years later, I am um, still doing it and I've, I've lost a significant amount of my vision since I was diagnosed, but technology has a, kind of allowed me to continue to do it in these really interesting ways using tablets that light up and sort of like illuminate much brighter than a sheet of paper can and allowing me to zoom in and out on details and I can work at my, my own pace. And I've had to unfortunately give up traditional painting a couple of years ago, but I was painting traditionally up until two years ago. Wow. Um, it, I'm, I'm so glad that we live in this technological age where, you know, there are, are ways around that. Um, it's in incredible, um, that, that you've been able to keep pursuing this and, um, just, wow. Um, <laughs> thank <wanna> you. Thank <laughs> you. I mean, I, I just want to add to that, like, yeah, you know, I, I've I've had the wonderful opportunity to speak to a lot of other people in my situation with my mm -hmm. same disease, and I, you know, the thing, first of all, the blind community is such a resilient community. There's so much strength there. But the thing I always tell people is, you know, you never know what technology will come up with next. If you are passionate about something, don't let a disability stop you from doing it there are ways to adapt we are very creative people you know and we can mm -hmm. we can find a way to we can just find a way to keep doing what we love we're here we get this one chance at life you, yeah. you know do the things that mm -hmm. really light you up from the inside yeah that's a great way of putting it um I want to touch on a bit the LGBT themes in the book um because that's what really drew me to this story um there's only recently been a small space opening for these LGBT stories within children's literature. And um, I would love to know about how the book has been received and just anything you have to say about the LGBTQ community's place in children's lit. Yeah, I think it's so incredibly important that these books exist and it's just never been more of a a topical thing, I guess, with um, the don't say gay bills that passed and all the stuff going on here in the United States regarding legislature that would try to inhibit um, things being taught on this level. I mean, I just feel <laughs> so incensed sometimes when I think about the argument that children shouldn't learn about different types of relationships. We've been learning about um, those um, throughout history, we've been learning about heterosexual relationships. And I remember coming home, at the, I mean, from school in the second grade, having learned about Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King and what they did for the civil rights movement. And, you know, though nobody was up in arms that I'd learned about a husband and a wife, because my first question wasn't, well, how did 
you know, the two of them make love. I was never, I wasn't thinking about mm. their, them, them and their identity as sexual just because I learned that they were married. And mm -hmm. so the idea that we would somehow, children would think the same thing when they learn about two men marrying or two women being together or non-binary non or transgender people, I just, it's so ridiculous to me because children don't think that way. Children, um, it's so important, I think, the foundation really begins at such a young age. Love and acceptance starts in that our youngest generation. And so having materials that make it normal and 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 demonstrate that love um, is going to, of course, instill the next generation with far more love and acceptance um, to combat the incredible amount of vitriol and hate that we still see in the country today. So that's where I think it all begins. I really think it starts with the youngest generation and having access to stories like the Pengrooms, which isn't beating anybody over the head with a, an agenda here. It just happens that the characters in the book um, are same-sex couples. And I think that's just a really important thing. Um, and yes, you're right. There are more and more of these coming about but as we we've seen in the news and many of them are being shut down banned and mm. removed from the libraries and in schools so i'm really heartened by the fact that the pengrooms have been embraced i received letters from preschools and and, and um, schools around the country every week uh, with pictures oftentimes showing the kids reading oh. the books. I, one of my favorite things is just a little girl taking her nap with the book, clutching the Penguin's oh. book. And... <laughs> that is so cute. And oh my God. Yeah. And a video from a, a pre, a pre, a pre-K class in Vermont. I received this a few weeks ago, um, a teacher reading the book to her children who there's a repeated line in the story as there often is in a children's story and it, it really the repeated line is um they made a great team because it's really about the teamwork between pringle and finn mm -hmm. and to hear the children at the end of each section as a group repeat because they made a great team i mean to see this this these children just light up and um mm -hmm. read the story along with their teacher it i mean it's more touching than I could have really prepared myself for to see that it really is making a difference and it's touching the lives of the young of the children oh my goodness that is incredible um yeah wow and I, <laughs> yeah. I couldn't agree with you more about how important this all is and uh yeah I have heard that there is potentially a second pengrims on the way um yeah. to talk a bit about the, the potential second pengrooms? Well, I'll give you a little insider information. I am, I as we are talking on the phone, because I, I am drawing it right now, I'm, as we've been, <laughs> as we've been speaking, I'm sketching away. Oh, um, really? <laughs> oh, yeah. Because I'm, it's like, I I have so much, I mean, this is, this is, this is on a deadline. And so I, mm. this is sort of my, every day of the week, I am working on the book. Yeah. And so, among some of the, our other you know, responsibilities, I'm, I'm squeezing in this book because it's just so important to me to continue mm. their story. Uh, so I'll tell you, it's called The Secret Ingredient. It's it's a continuation of the story of the, the cake delivery concept, except Pringle and Finn are delivering cakes to LGBTQ families celebrating birthdays. And the families are really important to the story because uh, they are... Um, families, some with two moms, some with two dads, and like in, in one family in, in, in where the even the child is sort of expressing their own gender identity in a way that really resonated with me like growing up um, as well, uh, because I do think that's really important, you know, to show that that's normal. It's normal to not to to question your own identity and to, like that's not a that's not a crazy thing and i just want to create safe space around that um but primarily the book is just about lgbtq families and those dynamics two 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 moms and two dads and ultimately it's about the pangrooms themselves uh, adopting their first child so we kind of follow them through these scenes and then the final cake that they deliver is a cake to the birth the literal birthday of their their own 
baby penguin. So. Oh, well, I'm really excited to see it. Um, that sounds like such a, a wonderful way to continue their story. And um, I just can't wait to see what's next. Um, yes. Well, it's sort of art. Well, as it often does, art is imitating life. I mean, just like <laughs> with the first book based on our uh -huh. marriage, Matthew and I are um, currently um, working on our becoming foster parents so that we can adopt. Oh, amazing. Yes. Wow. So we're going through that whole certification. So like Pringle and Finn are kind of beating us to it right now. We're probably gonna... <laughs> <laughs> but they're paving the way for us. So. Funny. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Paul. That's all my questions. It was wonderful getting to speak with you. Oh, yeah. I'm so glad uh, that you reached out, Brooke. I'm very excited to be able to talk about this and to share it with your your readers. And um, yeah, I really appreciate it. I think, you know, this is a, an exciting time for change and I'm just, I'm excited to see what, what comes next. Me too, me too. Yay! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I'll well, send you I'll a copy. You. I'll send you a copy you of will? the new book. Oh, absolutely. oh my God, that would be amazing. That would yeah. be incredible. I would love that. Oh, um, I would love that. Uh, I'll leave you to your illustrating. It sounds like you're you're very busy, uh, <laughs> and and I wish you luck on um, <laughs> your second book and and everything and and um. I appreciate I hope, it. I hope, yeah, hope spring is treating you well. Thank you. Oh, it's my favorite time of year. It's my absolute Me favorite too. time of year. Yeah, I love spring. <laughs> uh, it's like when we wake up from that long winter, right? You know, it's yes. just like oh light and flowers and yeah it's, it's it doesn't get any better <laughs> yeah it could not be more warmly welcome <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well thank you so much thank you bye brooke bye